This is an insect killer from eBay, and it's not the type that uses high voltage to zap them, it's the sticky mat type. So it comes with three of these mats, and they've got a protective layer. You peel it off, exposing the glue, and note that it's not covering the whole area, it's just covering a sort of, well there's a margin at the edge, big reason for that, I'm not going to peel it off right now, otherwise it will end up very sticky. The idea behind that is you slide it in the end here, is this going to slide in the end? Maybe it's not going to slide in the end. And it goes down into guides. The backing is stopping it going down to the guides. One moment, I'll just stuff that like that. And uh, once you've slid it in, the ultraviolet light attracts the insects to it. It's UVA light. And then when they fly around it, they get stuck onto the mat. And when it's got enough on it, you just pull it out and you put a new one in. And I was uh, investigating... Uh, I fancied 3D printing one actually, but uh, it was easy enough to find the tubes. These are UVA tubes. So the ones that are commonly used in uh, in the nail varnish curing things, the ultraviolet curing uh, nail varnish. And you can get sets of four tubes for something like £10 in the UK. But finding the ballast to drive it, an electronic ballast or even another ballast, and the holder for the lamp turned out to be so complicated and expensive that it was cheaper just to spend 20 quid to buy one of these. This one plugs straight in at the wall. Uh, it says power 9 watts. I've measured it, um, and it came in at 8 watts, which is pretty good. Also notable, there's a cable tie holding the lamp in. I wonder if they've had the lamps popping out in postage. If you can't get replacement mats, I suppose you could get the conventional ones that you can just buy large sheets of this sticky material. But if you did that, you'd have to get some paper strips and something, put it down the side so that it didn't stick when it ran down the little runners at the side here. But anyway, let's open it up. Things worth mentioning. UVA, the black light blue UVA tube, also used in the, well, the fly zappers as well as this type. Uh, I'm looking for a screwdriver here. It's the safer area of UV that uh, is just beyond human visual perception. The reason it looks bright blue is because the it's got the phosphor, but it's also got the sort of like the emission lines of the mercury spectrum that are visible to the human eye. I think it's a green and amber, and that gives it that turquoisey color. But in reality, the important wavelength is not actually visible from this. And it's the same tubes um, that you are used in disco lights, but they use what's called wood glass, wood glass, which is a black filter glass well it looks black but it passes it blocks the bright blue but it passes the uh the important ultraviolet wavelength the tubes you don't want to use are uvb or uvc since those are the ones that are a bit dodgy and uh, you can recognize those ones because particularly uvc which is quite harmful to your eyes uh, because the tubes are clear this one has the phosphor on it i wonder what it says in the tube itself it just says uv9 watt Let's take the screws out and open it up and see what sort of ballast it's got inside. It's very, very light, so I'm expecting an electronic ballast. Just a little circuit board, a bare circuit board inside. I was surprised how hard it was to get the electronic ballasts. It shows how LED lighting has already displaced uh, the sort of fluorescent era of lighting. Because with LEDs you're looking for just like a fixed current or fixed voltage driver. Okay, moment of truth, what's inside? A very tiny ballast. Let's cut that cable tie now, because uh, it means the tube can be removed easily. Is anything else going to fall out when I do that? Right, tell you what, let's get the uh, ballast out and take a look at it, because that's going to be quite interesting. I see a little capacitor at that end. Let's short that capacitor out before I touch it and discover that it's got a zappy potential. Short that out. Okay, with a metal screwdriver, that's a, a wise move. Right, tell you what, there's not an awful lot in this. That has so little on it. But anyway, let's analyse the circuitry in this and see what it looks like. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is done, let's explore. So before I start, I'll quickly recap how one of these fluorescent tubes works because that will make more sense of the ballast for it. So this is a glass tube with a partial vacuum drawn and it's been filled with a mixture of argon or krypton 
and mercury vapour. And there's a co coating of phosphorin inside and the glass itself won't pass the really short wave ultraviolet wavelengths, but it will pass the longer ones. And in this case, it's tuned to uh, emit mainly at 365 nanometer. 365 nanometer. So it converts the shorter wavelengths of ultraviolet using the phosphors to actually concentrate a lot of the energy in the 365 nanometer spectrum. In the end of each uh, end of the tube is a little heated cathode with a coating on it called a thermoemissive coating. And uh, when you heat that up, it naturally emits electrons. And what that does is it lowers the voltage required to actually strike the tube. Because if you didn't do that, if you just applied uh, power across this tube, it would uh, not want to strike unless you raised to a very high voltage. And if you did that, it would actually damage these electrodes. They're not designed to be operated cold like a cold cathode tube. So what happens when you start it up is that these heaters are heated up first and when they reach a suitable temperature and the voltage across them drops then the current starts flowing through the tube. So initially you'll get a high voltage across it and then it will drop to about say 90 volts across the tube. In the past they used to use a little glow starter between the two ends of the heaters so that in the, with the initial high voltage of the open circuit tube the unstruck tube, it would cause a glow discharge in the glow bulb that had a biometallic strip and it would bridge these two connections here and the current would flow through the heaters. Then because it was had shorted itself out, the glow discharge tube would uh, the, uh, cool down and the biometallic strip would open again. And if it was hot enough, if they were hot enough to actually lower the voltage enough, it would then strike through the tube. In other cases, when they're using the high frequency ones, they tend to have a little capacitor across them. And that can either be in the actual driver itself, or in the case of this one, which is only two pins, it's actually in here. And the value of that capacitor, I noted it down, is 3.3 nanofarad. And the heaters are only about 9 ohms each. So that's a principal operation. The main thing is you have to limit the current through this. Uh, because if you didn't, it will just draw as much current as possible. Like when you exceed the voltage of an LED's forward voltage and it suddenly starts drawing lots of current. Let's take a look at the schematic. The schematic here, well, the, not the schematic, but the actual circuit board, has the main inductor here, which we'll call L1. L1. And it's the bit that actually limits the current through the tube. Um, because the whole circuit is operating at very high frequency, it doesn't have to be like a huge big magnetic ballast like you used to find in old fluorescent fittings. It can be a much smaller inductor. Um, and to provide feedback to the self-oscillating circuit based on these two transistors here, there is a feedback uh, transformer. The top winding here with seven turns is actually in series with L1. So all the current flowing through the tube and that inductor goes through this as well. And it induces current in two other windings that then drive these transistors but the windings are in opposite parallel so that only one transistor can be on at a time and that results in a push-pull effect. Other things worth of note, uh, the incoming supply has a 0.2 ohm resistor over here, um, a class X2 capacitor and then a smooth uh, bridge rectifier and then smoothing capacitor here. That is about it. Right, tell you what, I'll show you the version I did for ease of reverse engineering. Here it is here if you want to take a quick snapshot of that, although it doesn't necessarily show where tracks are passing under things. But now we'll cut straight to the chase and look at the schematic, because the schematic is where it's all happening. I'll put that out of the way. It's a very simple schematic. It's slightly perplexing. One bit had me puzzling for a while, and it was the starting circuit. So here's the incoming supply. They've got that 0.2 ohm resistor. I think it's being used as a fuse. A 100 nanofarad Class X2 interference pressure capacitor, the bridge rectifier, and then a 4.7 microfarad, 4.7 microfarad, uh, 400 volts, so it's a death beam capacitor. And that provides 350 volt supply to the circuitry. The... Best way to describe this now, so these two transistors will alternate backwards and forwards and as they do so, the current will flow backwards and forwards through this in inductor and to 
avoid continuous current flow in one direction. There is a 22 nanofarad capacitor down here. This incident is a tube with the two heaters and the 3.3 nanofarad capacitor bridging them. Um, when it's Starting up, initially the current will flow through heaters and that capacitor to warm them up. Um, but once it's actually running, the current bypasses, well, to a degree it bypasses, but it goes through the tube, which is off shot here, uh, and passes through the gas. And the voltage across that will drop, but some current will still flow through this capacitor, which helps keep the electrodes hot. So, things worthy of note. There's the main inductor, L1. And there's the primary of the feedback transformer. That then has two separate coils, one driving this transformer uh, transistor and one driving this transistor. Notice that they're both NPN transistors. I should have noted what model they were. 13003 MJE 13003. Very common in this application. They may be specifically aimed at this type of product. So, initially to start up, and this is a bit that got me perplexed, this capacitor here and these two resistors here, when you start it up, it won't start oscillating itself. It needs something to trigger it. And quite often in other designs, that involves a little capacitor charging and then a, a diac, which then dumps a pulse of current to the base to actually kickstart it and start it oscillating. In this case, they're taking a different approach. Whereas with uh, this uh, transistor up here, They've got the feedback winding and a 22 ohm resistor driving the base directly. In the case of this one down here, they've got a capacitor and in series, which will still pass the AC but will block DC. Initially, when it's not running, current will flow through this 680K resistor and this 680K resistor, and it will charge up that capacitor, which noting that the capacitor is effectively reverse biased at that point. But the main thing is that some current will flow into the base, the transistor, and it starts turning on. When it does, that's such a low bias current that uh, it will start feeding back to itself through this uh, inductor here, this uh, winding. And when it uh, reaches the saturation point that it can't actually pass any more current through the circuitry because of that capacitor or because of uh, the saturation of one of the inductors, I'm guessing, but I think capacitor pretty much sets it. Then the field will start collapsing because that turns off. Um, and then as it collapses, it actually really turns this off and uh, to the point they actually have to have a diode between the emitter and the base to actually protect it from the reverse potential reverse voltage and uh, then it actually turns on the other transistor so they start oscillating backwards and forwards it's odd i think i've covered everything there it's a very complex circuit to describe because everything is happening at once and it's very very fast but the main thing is that this feedback uh, winding with the two transformers means that these transistors should theoretically not switch on at the same time in the past when they overheated they used to start partially conducting if they do that uh, they'll form a direct bridge across 350 volts to zero volts shunting the main supply and they'll go bang and that is something that used to happen in early ballasts uh, nowadays, because the transistors have evolved so much, the compact fluorescent lamps, you actually open them up and the area around the transistors is actually brown. It's really heated up and yet they still survive, which is quite incredible. But that's an interesting circuit. The use of the two resistors here, and the two of them are needed um, because of the way this circuit works. The fact that this line here is not connected to either positive or negative initially means that this... Uh, it will pass current right all the way through. But um, as soon as it starts conducting, then it's alternately effectively kind of bridging that resistor and then shunting it to the zero volt rail when it's actually running. It's a very clever design. Someone uh, worked a way they could save money by doing that. But that is it. That is the driver for the tube, which, I mean, that's this was supposed to be about the sticky mats. Let's peel, peel one off and see how sticky it is. going to peel it up. I'm going to brighten it up just a little bit and I'm going to peel it back. Oh, that is very sticky to the point that it's almost peeling off. Mm, is it really sticky or is it? Oh, no, it is actually very, very sticky. And that's what the flies stick to. So the idea is that once it's covered, in, well, once it's half covered in flies, because you want to leave some space for more to stick to, then you just slide it out with all the dead flies in it and just stick another one in. 
But that's it. The little electronic driver, just a lamp holder, the sticky cards that slide in here, and uh, a little housing around it, just to kind of make it look decorative. That is what it is. The ultraviolet enticing sticky flytrap. Uh, also worth mentioning, during my research for the ultraviolet, I found some research that suggested that the flies have a preference for blue and ultraviolet light while they're actually resting. But while they're actually active and foraging for food or whatever flies do, they will actually go to green light. So the temptation is to p perhaps uh, hook something like this up with green LEDs in it and see which one attracts the most flies. But there we go. Interesting thing. Very simple. Um, and it doesn't make sparking popping noise like the electric one and spray bits of dead bug everywhere.